Hi, um, so I just wanted to briefly explain um, the background for the thesis I'm writing in my paper, Middle Eastern Christianity, um, as you see written here, is the name of the unit um, that I will be presenting at for the AAR, American Academy of Religion. The topic is going to be Middle Eastern um, Christianity as well as late traditions of the Antique East, which is the other unit um, that has come together with Middle Eastern Christianity um, to create a co-sponsored unit. Um, one of its um, panels is going to be one where they had featured me to discuss the uh, this paper I submitted um, for that unit. So they had accepted it and I'm writing a paper. It's on basically the premise of my paper is um, that um, in um, looking at the ancient Christianity uh, and its spread to the East, so into Asia, into um, basically East Asia, Russia, uh, for some part, and even, I, I don't know, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, yeah, I mean, Southeast Asia as well, I think, uh, China, definitely, um, and, uh, you know what, let's just say, uh, India and Turkey, because the Mongols had, uh, basically, uh, forms of power, I don't want to say caliphates, but they had, they developed the, the rulerships there, the Mughals and the, the Ottomans, yeah, okay, so, basically, into Asia, into Asia Minor, into, um, China, into Southeast Asia, and into India, the Mongols, the spread of Christianity, as far as it got, um, in those areas, and how it was linked to this expansion of the Mongols. Now, the Mongols are independently, are studied independently of, of Christianity, of course, as their own people who did not identify with the religion, but were rather actually like these shamanistic, um, uh, spiritual, spiritualist uh, type of um, uh, tribe people, empire, like a genus of, of, of people, of, of, of a class of, of, of people, of a species, I guess, is a genus because it belongs to a species. Um, but the species would, uh, is there a species? The species would be humans, <laughs> probably. Uh, so Mongols are up there, and they've, um, they've, they've secured their spot in history as a empire, as an imperial kingdom, people, uh, not kingdom, maybe, uh, empire for sure, um, and in this I'll probably mention how they're broken down uh, socially, uh, politically, because um, it was the Khan, the great Khan, so it was the Khanates, um, and the Mongols are really um, a, uh, um, I suppose, I mean, so they basically got absorbed into into all those respective um, types of people. Uh, so in India, in Turkey, in, I guess, Persia, um, as well as uh, China, the Kublai Khan. <laughs> it was a, a Chinese emperor in, in textbooks and Chinese history. Um, and I'll be talking about how um, the Mongols were very much related to Christianity, but they also got absorbed, but Christianity got absorbed, but not really because the, my, I, in my argument, I would say the Mongols absorbed Christianity, and that, that's going to be its own, uh, I think, um, theory, uh, hypothesis, you know, uh, proposed trajectory um, for basically um, the history of Christianity into the East, in the Middle East, for sure, definitely, and um, and how those uh, <laughs> those syn syndicated Christianity kind of got dispersed out there, and 
Yeah, so the reason um, that I chose to write about Mongols, the Mongolians, Eastern Christianity is because um, I've been very interested as of late, it was it was sort of a coincidence uh, that came together, that came at the same time of me um, beginning to teach uh, world history for uh, some high schoolers, and then I also started a book, a book that I saw at a bookstore, and then I picked up, and then I picked, it, I didn't buy it, but then I saw it at the school that I was teaching at, so I picked it up and I read it, which was on the Mongols, and this is actually very much kind of directly, what directly inspired me to even consider writing this um, was was this theory that, um, well basically this thesis in this book, um, it was uh, Genghis Khan and the, and the making of the modern world uh, by Jack Weatherford. Uh, Genghis Khan is, uh, was the, basically the, the pre preeminent conqueror of the of the Mongol Empire um, and the book just writes it details how um, the I guess the like the Mongolian record of Genghis Khan's life and how it illustrates you know he I mean the author basically illustrates uh, condenses all these sources um, to create this like uh, this narrative of, of Genghis Khan, his youth, his upbringing, you know, the context of where he was, and then um, basically the events of his life, you know, what the legends say, what the, the written uh, history says. And he, you know, he writes in plain English for us to read, and uh, it, it basically also posits, like, by the end that, you know, the end chapter is that he his influence had basically reached you know his personal influence really um basically reached you know the ends of europe and you know the western edges of europe and you know the southeast edges of of asia and even up until i think they got korea and then didn't quite make it to japan um japan means rising east so you could say that's the farthest um and then uh he makes the the statement that he um, that Genghis Khan's influence basically basically structured the entire modern world, and um, it it was just a um, what's the word? a pivotal point a pivotal point in his um, or rather in in the global history and. Uh, others, you know, some would even say global history, um, but that's another conversation. Uh, at that time, actually, the new world was actually peaking as well, uh, <laughs> right on time, um, and that this all happened actually very much, very much, um, uh, it was, it was, the late middle ages high middle ages as well as just kind of this this cusp of like um the medieval world lifestyle in the europe and then be you know right before becoming you know all of the the renaissance i guess the the, the pre-modern world i guess they would call it pre-modern into the you know into the rest of history, so like industrialization, uh, modernization, um, imper you know, basically imperialism, globalism, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it came through Europe, basically, um, which is another line of, I think, another lineage of, of development, the Europeans, but basically that, that essence of, of going into the modern world, of globalizing, of really... Um, uh, you know, trade, basically. I also say trade, so that's why I'm focusing on Max Weber, that it's uh, more of a economic kind of phenomenon, uh, turn of the turn of the empire. And then I'm also actually going to link that to back to uh, Christianity, actually. Christianity, Mongols, back to Europe, and it's this other few lineages. 
Okay, so I'm going to talk about my research, and I wanted to break down how far I am in my process in terms of um, creating my paper after I have submitted a proposal, done research, have a bibliography, no annotations, and um, some general topics, ideas, points of focus for me. I'm still developing the argument, and I'm still um, putting together my evidence for my analysis. Um, as you can see here, I have um, named a sociologist that I do want to feature as a um, as a reference in my uh, in my citation. So Max Weber, uh, I'm going to use his ideas much like as I've learned he's used others' ideas. Um, he's also I just learned that he um, actually wrote that um, wrote down himself as a historian of economics. Now, this is very, um, this is a specific statement because he's putting together um, the, the study of economics as a, as a science in his own way. At this time in his period, there had been uh, physical sciences not so much social sciences, but it's the fact that he was putting together the notion of economics as a science, as well as um, attaching that to sociology. And he was, he's often credited as one of like a, a type of, um, you know, father of sociology. And it was really, um, I think, his influence on the social sciences, how uh, very much in that generation, there was this birth of psychology, the sociology, anthropology, um, and economics, where uh, Weber was very much a seminal, um, a seminal uh, social scientist, I suppose. Um, as opposed to just being, you know, um, you know, just being a, a philosopher or a, um, I guess a psychologist or anything like that. He was very much a predecessor of that, and he was uh, very much. Um, technical in his descriptions and actually describing technicality itself. Uh, so he was a very much, I think, a philosopher in that sense, um, defining economics, defining um, this, this abstracted system, you know, indexing the different kinds, the different forms that it comes in. And um, Max Weber was very much uh, um, a forefather, a creator, a writer in that sense. Um, but at the same time, he was uh, a departure from, I think, the more, um, I guess, uh, heightened, not heightened, um, heuristical uh, philosophy of the time. So of course you had Descartes, and, and just other point, other um, philosophers who marked a departure, a point of departure from a, the previous area of philosophy. So he's definitely in that ladder, um, on that on this side of um, that change. So um, I think he's a very uh, good record of of history as it had been understood in the Western civilization, as well as um, uh, the Christian influence. Um, and I, I'm really trying to create this, uh, this uh, connection between the Mongols and the Eastern churches. That's my main thesis there at the top um, and really how I'm going to employ his thoughts, um, his, his writings into the, the thesis I have there of, of Mongols and Eastern Christianity. 
Okay, so basically, um, I started by saying in the paper I present the affinities of the Mongols' expansion westward into the Middle East and Near East, their assimilation of the Eastern churches and the tolerance of religion as a function of the philosophical commonalities between Eastern Christianity and Mongolian imperial imperial spiritualism. So this is basically what by the end I want to prove, right? And this is this is very underdeveloped. I actually have not touched this uh this is specific piece of writing since I submitted my paper to the conference. So um just going back to it obviously, you know, I'm stating I'm trying I well I want to state clearly basically my objective in the paper, but also um you know, I guess stating the the re the relationship between these two you know seemingly distinct independent topics so we have um the mongol empire right um i'll make it green oh sorry here i'll just make it green oh my gosh green uh, absorbed the Eastern churches, green, political, religious, and cultural ideologies, which caused their minimalization in global Christianity. So here I'm referencing a different author's, uh, a different author's theory. Um, I just heard that there was an affinity between the Eastern Church is as defined by the author Philip Jenkins, and this is a book I'm referencing. Uh, I quoted it because you couldn't see italics in the paper photo, but that's a book where he addresses the juncture of Christianity East of Byzantium as differentiated elements of adherence to the Christian faith found in the Middle East differentiated remnants of adherence so i assess that there's an affinity so this is back to my argument basically this is my argument but i'm i'm saying there's an assimilation and then i state this as an independent argument the tolerance of religion underlined and then function is a whole other probably because I've worked with Jung before, um, Jungian theory, and I know he calls psychological processes as functions. So, at least in you know his English translations of of, of his German um, writings. So here I'm I'm saying a function, but I'm basically also I'm also citing math, you know, in the sense that it's dependent on this on this variable. So I guess the variables I'm using is um, function of the f this is the variable I'm using so well here function so it's a function of the philosophical commonalities now this is a whole other like whole other uh, statement um philosophical commonalities like here um which is basically I'm trying I'm trying to find the language to say this. Uh, Weber uses all types of sociological words in German, so um, I'm gonna have to refine this definition for philosophical commonalities. But the tolerance, so I said the tolerance of religion was basically dependent on the economic action here of Weber of of, of what. Weber defines as economic action and I'm kind of I'm kind of importing my own interpretation of economic action as like this psychological process because I did work with Jung um and he was a well he he wasn't a psychoanalyst really he was actually an anal an analytical psychologist because that's what his field was was called defined he was very much um a contemporary of Freud in defining basically kind of his own predecessor of psychology of psych psychoanalysis basically um a predecessor an antecedent you could say as well um that's young there 
So, as you can see here, um, I state that um, that I'm referencing this author, I'm referencing this argument, and then I state what he what what his argument is. So he states that the juncture of, Christ of Christianity east of Byzantium as differentiated remnants of so right here is its own is its own subject basically where he addresses so here's this the juncture of christianity this should really should say east east of byzantium and byzantium apparently is a historical term for what was actually uh it was basically the eastern roman empire sorry i'm shaking my camera um, the juncture of Christianity east of Byzantium, East of Roman Empire, uh, Constantinople, um, I think it was Antioch. Antioch is basically what um, Turkey was. So, as differentiated remnants of adherence to the Christian faith found in the Middle East. So again, the Middle East is something that is being um sort of contested here um in the sense that uh i'm sort of stating that the middle east was um including central asia including the steppe including mongolian including um eastern christianity and the churches have expanded out so i'm not you know obviously the east asia is going to be east asia but Eastern Christianity into Asia was has um, an extensive history in, in, in the Middle Ages during this period when the Mongols were definitely active, when the Mongols are, um, you know, um, they're, they're, about, they're, um, they're basically entertaining different religions, you know, in their court. They have these debates with the different, in, in, <laughs> basically they're, 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 they're different you know, practitioners of the different races, of the different um, religions, um, you know, who, who have different races as well. So they're, they're, they're being tolerant of not just, you know, different creeds, different faiths, different, um, you know, Christianity, um, but they're, they're, they're tolerating different races as well. They're, do they're, they're tolerating different ethnicities and heritages and patterns, cultural patterns, um, because the Mongols were actually very much removed probably from a lot of those cosmopolitan identities, those uh, roots in land and people and, and the ground. Um, so the Mongols were actually very much, uh, they were willing, you know, they were, they were, they were entertaining these other cultures, basically, um, despite the fact that, that spiritually they also also uh, uh, diverged. They distinct. They were diverged. Um, they diverged spiritually as well. So, but I guess they go hand in hand, uh, the spiritual and the cultural, um, uh, not just in how I guess religions are acquired and and adhere to. Um, uh, you know, you could say cultures are acquired by religions, but um, wait, basically what I want to state is that um, the Mongols were an ethnicity, they were a tribe, they were a culture, um, and they were they were certainly their own, they don't call it, they, it's not a religion though, it's, it's a spiritualism, they call it shamanism, spiritualism, it's what basically Genghis Khan is recorded to believe, um, and that's sort of where I got the idea basically that uh, the Mongols could have been, you know, monotheistic in their sense solely for the fact that you know their law their 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 regents their right you know the reg regnants I, I believe right the regnum the reg regnant the right king uh the reigning person was christian in to a, a certain extent but not quite you know they're, they're not christian but were the people you know past byzantium christian at all ever well uh, we have to look at that and, and dissect it um, according to theology, according to scripture, really, um, and the history and the lineage and the, um, the sequence, the descendants of fathers uh, and such. Um, yeah, so um, I really want to clarify the statement that I made 
um, with uh, the Mongols entertaining religions in the court because um, before I stated that I wasn't um, I, I guess I hadn't mentioned that the Mongols didn't have um, a court basically when Genghis Khan was alive obviously uh, Genghis Khan was very much um, a military leader and he did have a he, he had an inner court of course but in the, in like this tribal sense of uh, this is the inner circle the inner like advisory uh, judiciary even type of court that he had um, but the court that I was mentioning about of the different religions so you know Genghis Khan so Genghis Khan I believe had contact himself with different religions. I, I believe his mother was actually of a Christian origin or something like that. I'd have to double check that, but he had Christian uh, influence into his own um, uh, family and life. And that's, I think that's in like their sacred kind of scripture of, of Genghis Khan as well, that he was very much like of a, a Christian, um, a Christian background, basically, uh, a forefather, um, and it was an historian Christian, I believe, it was Borg, uh, not, was it, is it Borg, his mom? I think that's her name, um, but basically, Genghis Khan, um, worshipped, um, a, not, it was a sky, it was a, a mountain god, but it was uh, the great sky, I believe. Um, and Mongol, uh, what, Mon you know, Mongol is the name of the the people that he basically uh, brought together. They were already sort of defined already um, as a set of people. Like they were in different tribes and different clans. Um, and they had different khans or khanates. I don't think they're called khanates, but they had different khans of their people, of the Mongols, and they knew who they were, they competed amongst themselves, sort of, uh, in the steppe at this time, when Genghis Khan comes, um, uh, into the, onto the stage, basically, <laughs> and he's growing up among these, these tribal people who are more or less, you know, they're people of the steppe, they're the Mongol, you know, they're, they're, they live in the mountains, and, um, in the, the great, expanse of like the raw you know the, the flat pastures like of asia they go on for miles and miles and miles um rivers there's there's um, a commonality between the rivers that they have there so it's like a spiritualism um connected to the land uh that so that was that was what genghis khan worshipped and you know you could say believed in but that that, that that word's not even um worth saying because he worshipped he sort of worshipped in his being he asked he asked him for counsel and as such but um obviously um a lot of also in the, in the histories it's it's stated that uh he had a lot of support from shamans so not only were they mobile but they were in they were organized um and he's actually historically uh said to have organized his his men um by the hundreds of thousands basically in sets of tens where there was the ten at the top with him and then each each one of those had ten of theirs and each one of those had tens of theirs and tens of theirs something like that uh and it might multiply it might have multiplied there where they had a bigger group under one person but basically each person had had a set of ten and it was you know hundreds of thousands that we're talking we're talking you know not quite a million but very stackable towards a million um of a of um you know a conqueror's herd a conqueror's uh he was a conqueror, basically. So he didn't quite have a court um, the way that his son had, or they had a capital by the time his his, their, his son, his 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 grandson, Ogade, I believe. So, um, so they entertained religions at least by that second generation removed from Genghis Khan. But Genghis Khan was very much a conqueror. He killed plenty of people. He was very violent, in fact. Um, but he sort of bases violence ac according to this other code and ethics that he kind of uh, derived from himself. Um, so I, I, I'll, I'll, um, um, and basically that's sort of where I also got inspired to sort of make this connection between, uh, Christianity basically and, um, 
Genghis Khan, um, it became um, an increasing, you know, interest of mine, like a deepening interest or intrigue that I had uh, after reading that book. And, you know, of course, um, I actually started to learn about the Middle Ages and how kind of those a thousand years that get de designated as the Middle Ages, how they sort of become, well, they're, well they are, <laughs> well, it's defined as this period for sure, and then there, it's all, actually, it's, and then it's actually attributed like these other kind of uh, general type of regard for like what even happened then, like oh well you know these thousand years like well actually nothing happened like, <laughs> but really um there's this empire like the Mongols like you know I'm reading this book and it's saying twelve hundreds thirteen hundreds and I'm like wow like this is a period that I know nothing else about like. And it, you know, it actually came to pass that the Black Death happened right after the Mongols happened to, you know, take over and, and, uh, and, um, basically conquer, uh, a lot of land within, a, with, within three generations, they had land, um, as east as, uh, Hungary, I believe, so not quite into, like, you know, Germany or Rome or anything, but Hungary to the west, and then, like, definitely way into, like, Asia, you have, uh, definitely, like, Asia Minor, and all down into southeast in, Asi in, in Asia, like, the Mughals were a Persian, Indian type of, uh, Mong Mongolian, uh, you know, ruling, ruling, ruling state, which is actually what I also wanted to get into, um, the Mongols had this state. They had this um, this administrative, managerial uh, component to them, which I found very interesting. Um, I think, especially because I had read of Young, and Young um, defines he defines like this management of like of psychological functions which i actually wrote a thesis on so i wrote a thesis on psychological functions and young and management and transcendental and i, I actually I actually already connected it to the bible um in college so here i'm making this connection um between the mongols as a people as sort of descendants the, these torchbearers sort of of this man <laughs> this one man genghis khan and you know, and, 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 you know, a theory to, to him as well as also like a, you know, a sub theory, uh, I attribute to him, uh, historically he has this, he has this sort of cult personality, um, which is, uh, kind of a deep term when you kind of study, uh, civilization like this, because, because it became a civilization and then it became a history of a people and then a nation, a country. Uh, well, it was a nation, but under that one man, though, um, and kind of how his history became the culture, became the lineage, and um, and the fact that he had this spiritualism to him that didn't really translate to a religion. It translates, it translated to a, an empire, and then like several kind of lineages and, and descendants, uh, empires, kingdoms, you know, nations of, of them of themselves, um, and. I think, I guess my, my core argument would be to say that it has an, I, I think, sort of this Christian uh, nature, this Christian influence, this Christian kind of derivative, um, as other religions were. I mean, you could take Manichaeism and uh, types of Gnostic Christians, um, the, the Mandaeans, I believe, were sort of sects of Christianity. Uh, you know, Essenes, all these other, uh, you know, crypt, crypt, cryptic kind of uh, uh, Christianities, basically. Um, but I would say Genghis Khan's spirit, but it didn't become religion. It was a spiritualism. It was a faith, a but it wasn't a creed, or was it? But that's why you get into, anyway, it was interesting. It was intriguing to me how that could have had this ab absorptive, I think, effect of, like, Eastern Christianity where it didn't become this church, like, you know, orthodoxy and, and things, but it became its own kind of creed, I, would, I guess, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, so basically, with all of that background, I really just wanted to um, frame out what 
the scope of my paper was and what my purpose was. Um, the Mongols expanded westward in, into the Middle East and the Near East. So again, um, the Mongols came from the steppe. They came from Central Asia and they were rapidly taking over a lot of, uh, you know, the, the Islamic Persian cities, um, you know, Baghdad and I forget, I forget what the other large one, large ones were, but they essentially took over these, these places, a lot of them, they got as far as, uh, I believe, with Hulalu into Saudi Arabia, um, very close to the, where the Crusades would have been happening, actually, and the Mongols, um, they, again, were, had their relationships, had their contacts eventually with, um, all of these religions, and they were very, um, they're very uh, commanding in their administration of like their economy, and I think that's where I got the uh, the idea of incorporating Max Weber because Max Weber discusses the functions of economic activity, economics, uh, and then he brings in sociology, so sociology of rule and um, other other. So he defines actually sociology of rule as. Uh, this specific term, this, and of course he breaks it down into, you know, uh, I believe he mentions, you know, um, authority um, in defining rule, and uh, of course he relates it back to um, this economical action. Uh, here, what do I say? I say uh, operators within the socially organized undergirding of economic structures. So. You know, he brings this formula for how economic structures actually work um, and how sociology is very much, uh, if anything, stems from that. Um, if not any other relationship to it, um, it's probably like a subset, sociology is a subset of economics, I, I believe he would argue. Uh, um, as far as I can tell at the moment, what he might be saying. Um, by applying these categories of sociology to an epistemological analysis, of the Mongolian ascent in power and economic influence. So I, I use epistemological, uh, I think, um, I think I, because I'm trying to be inclusive of, of the historiography of the Mongols to their culture, to their history, lineage, and identity. Um, mm, yeah, I can't speak to them as a nation, but definitely as a people, a people's uh, I guess a, a people's rule a people's dominion uh, like you know imp empire imperial it's a civilization I'm trying to to capture it as a civilization um, how they rose basically um, I would highlight that in power and economic influence and this would probably be There would be subcategories of Mongolian ascent. So if I'm gonna make this a subject, it would have to be all of this into one subject. Um, Cause I'm speaking very specifically on the fact that they were a civilization that had a very defined period of rule um, where they were overarching, they were dominant, they were um, very much influencing, uh, spawning, you know, siring the you know these other than kingdoms like what was you know they they all trace back to Genghis Khan and his 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 sons which, which split up and then uh, another set of grandsons or stepsons or something um, and um, their influence on the rest of civilization the rest of society of history um, the 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 remaining uh empires kingdoms but definitely also and i you know i i i wrote it here the remnants of adherence to the christian faith so basically everything uh again east of um byzantium which would be orthodox so i have it in here but orthodox orthodox 